may be seated. Good morning, Hopewell. Good to see you this morning. What a joy to celebrate with Dallas for 10 years of faithful scripture memorization. Man, that's impressive. Over 830 passages of scripture, completing all the Awana books. And so congratulations to Dallas. And we're celebrating with many in our faith family who graduated this weekend. We'll be honoring them next weekend in our service. And so I encourage you to to be here next week. And uh, man, if you'll look in your bulletin today, you will see a lot of new faces that have recently become a part of our faith family. New members that have joined in the past seven months. This is the second time we've, we've done that. We've had so many people join. I thought it would be beneficial if you could see their faces and see their names. And if you don't recognize a family that has joined, just try to find them, seek them out, welcome them warmly into our fellowship. Our family is growing, and it's an awesome thing to celebrate that. And so I praise God for all he's doing. You know, he promised that if we lift him up, he would draw all men to himself. And so we just keep lifting up Jesus and God keeps bringing people into our family. And so we're so thankful. And if you are on that list today, I hope you like the picture that we chose for you. And uh, I hope it was very slimming and complimentary of you, but uh, it's good to see all of you. Today, we begin a new series entitled, Why Worry? You know, when I think of all of those who graduated this weekend, they have been through it the last three years. All of us really have been through it the last three years. Uh, We've weathered a worldwide pandemic. There was a time when everything was shut down. We were all quarantined. We had to stay at home. Uh, Couldn't go to work anymore. Couldn't go to school anymore. For some of us, that was good to be around our family, to once again be around our wife and our kids. Some of you, uh, others of you might, might have lost your mind. You might have started to go crazy. Like, I can't believe I'm married to that person. You know, anyway, we've been through a lot. And and our nation was kind of involved in a lot of political turmoil, uh, social upheaval, cultural changes. We've been through it. But the one thing I've discovered after ministering through this time, especially the last three years, is I think the result of all of this change and uncertainty is that the number one thing that even Christians struggle with today is anxiety and worry. I think our anxiety and worry have gone way up. The fear of what's going to happen next, uh, doubting our security, and that's, that's what I hear from people over and over again. And so I thought it would be fitting to over the next couple of weeks, let's, let's take a look at God's word and see what the Bible has to say about worry and anxiety. And I, my prayer is that some of you who came this morning, you're literally bound by that in your life. You're literally bound and chained by worry and anxiety. I pray that God will loosen those chains. I I pray that through studying the words of Jesus this morning, that you will be set free uh, from this plague of anxiety and worry in your life. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. That's where we'll be this morning. Luke chapter 12. In this passage of scripture, uh, Jesus addresses two major areas of worry in our lives and then gives us some really fitting advice to overcome it. So if you found your place in Luke chapter 12, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. I will begin reading in verse 13. Jesus is talking to what Luke calls an innumerable crowd of people. And someone from the crowd in verse 13 speaks up to him and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And if you underline things in your Bible, I encourage you to underline that statement. One's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and, body, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouses nor barn. And God feeds them. 
Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Father, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, we thank you for this wise advice to war against the worry in our minds and in our hearts. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would set some people free this morning. Lord, liberate them from these chains of worry and anxiety. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, in the the first part of this passage that I've read, verses 13 through 21, Jesus is essentially saying, number one, why worry about your wealth? Why worry about your wealth? You know, people search for purpose in a lot of places. Some look for purpose in their position that they have um, in society, their, their power, their popularity, uh, their parenthood. Some people find their purpose in, in parenthood, but mostly people find their purpose through their prosperity and their possessions. And Jesus, in this passage, makes a profound statement that I hope you took time to underline. One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Let's talk about money for a minute. And I know people get funny when you talk about money. And so you might get a little uneasy, you might squirm a little bit, but let's, let's talk about money. You work hard to get it so that you can spend it, manage it, or hoard it and save it. But you know, Sparks, I have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Sparks is in the funeral business. Our worship pastor was in the funeral business for a long time. And the, the fact of the matter is, no matter what you have on planet Earth, you cannot take it with you. You just can't. And so all this money that you work hard to, to spend or manage or even hoard, you can't take it with you. You will leave it to someone else who didn't work hard to get it, and then they will either spend it, manage it, or hoard it. You know, there is a place that you can invest your resources uh, that will have an eternal reward. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically, when you have more stuff, it equals more stress. I don't know what many of you did when you were quarantined in your house, but when I was quarantined at home, my family started looking for series that we could watch, and we found something called Alone on the History Channel. Anybody familiar with the show Alone? People go out into the wilderness with rudimentary items, and the goal is to survive and to outlast everybody else. And if you are the last man or woman standing, you win a large sum of money. Well, Drew and I got into this show alone, and in particular, season six, because there was a guy named Jordan Jonas. He was from Lynchburg, Virginia. I graduated from Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, and so I'm like, hey, I want Jordan to win. Never met him in my life. I'm rooting for Jordan. We're team Jordan. And so we were rooting for Jordan, And, you know, when you're out in the wilderness, you are obsessed in thinking about the basics, food, shelter. That's it. How can I survive the changes in the weather and how can I provide sustenance for my body so that I can outlast people? So food equals money when you're in the wilderness. And it just so happens that Jordan Jonas, 20 days into the challenge, was able to kill a moose with a recurved bow. That's amazing. For you hunters out there, try going after a moose with a recurve bow. Jordan was successful. He drops this moose. And then he was like, man, this is, I I won the lottery. I basically won the food lottery. I'm going to win this thing. But he suddenly realized that having more meat and more food all at once caused him to burn more calories than everybody else because he had to work 
to maintain this wealth of food. He found that all of the scavengers that were around him, even some of the predators that were around him, all of a sudden began coming after his stuff. And so he had to build these food platforms that were elevated and climb up and down and burn all these calories. He started losing weight, even though he had all this food. It seems like the more he ate, the more he worked, and the more weight he lost, he realized that he needed to not only have this lean protein to survive, but he needed uh, fat that was in fish. He had to go fishing. He had to keep working. And in some ways, he had to work harder. Now, while Jordan ultimately won, one final lesson that Jordan learned was that you can't take it with you. He, he had the, the rack of this moose and he tried to take it home and the airline would not let him put the, the rack on the plane. You can't take it with you, Jordan, your trophy uh, for this life. But he says this, he says, the person who has stockpiles of food when it becomes scarce elsewhere also becomes a mark for predators and scavengers alike. What can look like abundance for a hunter can also make him the hunted Jordan learned the lesson, more stuff equals more stress. And sometimes that's why we worry about wealth. The more you have, the more you must manage to keep the scavengers away. You can't take it with you. A.J. Terry said so many people spend their health gaining wealth, and then they have to spend their wealth regaining their health. We work our bodies to death for 65 years to accumulate wealth so that we can rest the last 15 years and enjoy the fruits of our labor, but then we spend the last 15 spending all that we've earned trying to take care of our bodies and our failing brains. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? You say, I thought you were supposed to tell me how not to worry, Pastor, and all you're doing is giving me reason to worry. But there is a way to invest your temporal wealth in an eternal way, and that is to give it away. That's what Jesus says. You know, some billionaires that don't even believe in Jesus have discovered this reality long ago. Some 13 years ago, they came up with the giving pledge and billionaires around the world have signed this pledge that they will give away their fortunes before they die. Bloomberg is one of them. He said his goal is to give away his fortune that he's amassed so that he bounces the check to the funeral home. Sorry, Sparks, but he realizes, I can't take it with me. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to invest it in others. I'm going to do my giving while I'm living so I'm knowing where it's going. They don't want to leave it to their children because even secular studies have shown that inherited money does not lead to happiness. I was reading an article this week by Go Banking and it revealed that a staggering 70% of wealthy families lose their wealth by the next generation. 90% lose it in the generation after that. It's very rare that when parents pass along fortunes and money to their kids that they teach them the valuable lessons of what it took to get it and maintain it. And so they squander it. An article in Forbes magazine entitled The Vanderbilts, How American Royalty Lost Their Crown Jewels, describes how one of America's richest family, who at one time possessed more money than our national treasury, how they lost their fortune by the fourth generation. Their opulent homes throughout the United States are now just tourist attractions. Many many of you have been to the Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina. That's just one of many mansions that were constructed in the 1800s. One of the grandsons of the Vanderbilt fortune, William, remarked, inherited wealth is a real handicap to happiness. It has left me with nothing to hope for, with nothing definite to seek or strive for. Notice the irony of that statement. He says, wealth has left me with nothing to hope for, nothing to seek for. Listen, inheritance is what we leave for people. Legacy is what we leave in people. Maybe instead of working our fingers to the bone to leave piles of cash for our kids and grandkids, we should work on developing character in their hearts and lives that will outlast time and eternity. Amen? Keep the main thing the main thing. Show them that true value comes not in getting and having, but in earning, contributing, and giving. Zach Brown sings, it's funny how it's the little things in life that mean the most. Not where you live, what you drive, or the price tag on your clothes. There's no dollar sign on peace of mind, and this I've come to know. 
country philosopher, Zach Brown. Jesus goes on to say at the end of this passage in verses 33 through 34, sell your possessions. Give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasures will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Don't worry about your wealth. You want to know how you cannot worry about your wealth? Give it away. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Invest the wealth you have in eternity. God knows what you need. He knows what you need. Then in verses 22 through 32, Jesus essentially says, number two, why worry about your worth? Your worth. Why worry about your wealth? Why worry about your worth? Look again at verses 22 through 32. Jesus tells his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse or barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So if God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? You are worth more than the birds. You are worth more than the lilies. Don't worry about your worth. Don't find your worth, your value in your possessions, your position, your power, your popularity. Definitely not your prosperity and your possessions. Jesus told a story of a man who felt good about himself because of his big barns, because of his heavy harvest. And Jesus said he was a fool. Why? Because our worth is not found in our wealth. You know, net worth is the world's measurement. The world says this. The world says, list your assets. Those are the things you own. Estimate the value of each and then add up the total. And then list your liabilities. Those are the things that you owe. Add up the outstanding balances. Subtract your liabilities from your assets to determine your personal net worth. I'll wait while you guys do the math. That's the world standard. They say when you do all of that, whatever's left, that's what you're worth. Jesus says, no, no. Your life is more valuable than that. Your net worth is not your worth. In fact, all of those things that the world says is wealth and worth, in the end, all of that goes away. The Bible calls it wood, hay, and stubble. The only thing that remains after God's judgment is the motive, the motive. That's all that remains. Our net worth can only be found in the one who made us. Our purpose comes from him. Your worth is not determined by cash. It's determined by your king. Sorry, Dave Ramsey, but if cash is king, Jesus is not, right? Jesus is king, right? Jesus is king. In his best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life, pastor and author Rick Warren, he opens his book with a jarring phrase. How many of you have read The Purpose Driven Life? Raise your hand. Rick Warren, out of the gate, says this phrase, it is not about you. Your life, it's not about you. That makes us cringe inside. We think that life is all about ourself. We think that life is all about our stuff. But if it's all for you, then it's all in vain. If your life is all about your glory and not God's glory, it's all vainglory. You're basing your life on things that will melt away. You know, sometimes we, we get so full of ourselves, especially if we feel like we're prospering on this earth. You know, maybe if your net worth is a little higher than most and you start to feel important because of your positions and your possessions and things, and we start to promote ourselves, doesn't watching somebody promote themselves, doesn't that make you cringe when you see them self-promoting? Do you know why you're cringing? Because you're a self-promoter. And it's easier to see in someone else than it is in you. You're cringing because you see them doing 
what you so often do. We self-promote. We make life about ourselves because we buy the world's lie that our worth, our value comes in our possessions. That we're preeminent. Jim Carrey is one of the most successful comedians in the world. He's an actor as well and his net worth is estimated to be at $180 million. He's won every award in his industry and achieved worldwide fame. And this is what Jim Carrey says. I guess just getting to the place where you have everything everybody's ever desired and realizing that you're still unhappy and that you can still be unhappy is a shock when you have accomplished everything that you've ever dreamt of and more and then you realize, my gosh, it's not about this. And I wish for everyone to be able to accomplish those things so that they can see that too. Your worth in life is not about your wealth in life. And when you think about it, when, when you have some of the stuff that the world says you need and when you can calculate your net worth and you, you land near the top, what's the effect of having all of that worldly wealth, of having it all together according to the world? What's often the effect of finding your worth in a big net worth when you're worth more than other people is that you begin to actually think that you're worth more than other people. You notice that? We begin to to look down on others that are lesser, that have less as being undisciplined, uneducated, lazy, careless. The end is pride and self-righteousness. What is it that God hates? Pride and self-righteousness. Our worth is not in our wealth. You remember the story of the rich young ruler? He had it all together and at such a young age. All we know about the rich young ruler is that he was rich he was young, and he was a ruler, right? That's why you go to seminary to, to discern all of that knowledge. Uh, the rich, young ruler. But we say, hey, according to the world, this guy has it all together. He had everything but what money could not buy, and that was eternal life. And so he comes to Jesus, and he asks him, how do I find eternal life? And do you remember Jesus with a compassionate heart sees this guy? He says, keep the law. He says, this I've done, you know, for my youth. This guy's done it all, right? He's, he's got it all. And what does Jesus tell him? He said, go and sell all you have and then come after me. He knew that this young man was finding his worth in his wealth. And so he tested him. And what happened? Well, this young man, it says, was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus looking around said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God for those who find their worth in their wealth. Jim Elliott, missionary who gave his life on the field, reaching the Alka Indians, says he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's a proper perspective. We should not worry about our wealth. We should not worry about our worth. Many of you are familiar with uh, George Beverly Shea. He was the worship leader who rose to notoriety here in America by traveling with Billy Graham, doing the Billy Graham Crusades. George Beverly Shea would lead music before every Billy Graham Crusade. And at the age of 23, you might not realize that George had a hard decision to make. He was offered a a secular singing position in New York City. It, It came with a great salary and wide respect. He would have been among the who's who of singers back in his day. Or he could continue singing in churches and for Christian radio programs. So while he was sitting at the family piano, he started to prepare a special hymn for the Sunday service. And on the piano, he found a poem written by Mrs. Ray F. Miller. He immediately began to compose the music for the poem. And he used that song the same morning in his father's church service. And he also used those words, the words of that song, to direct his life. And he shared the song, I'd Rather Have Jesus, in Crusades Across America. You remember the song? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain. Or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus 
than anything this world affords today. Why would a young man choose that path, choose that poem to be the anthem of his life when he had so much prosperity promised him? It's because George Beverly Shea realized that his worth was not in what the world says. He realized that his worth came from God who made him, who fashioned him, who gifted him his voice, who had a plan and a purpose for him that was greater than all the wealth of the world. George realized that to give himself up for God was the greatest thing that he could ever choose, that there was more wealth and treasure waiting him in heaven than anything this world could offer. He found his worth in him. Listen, if an item's worth is truly de- determined by the price someone's willing to pay for it, you need to remember that God paid the ultimate price of his only begotten son for you. That's your worth. That's your value. You are worth the shed blood of the prince of heaven. That's how much you're valued. Our executive pastor's son, Walker Barrett, gave his valedictorian speech yesterday to a packed house of his fellow students at his graduation. And he boldly reminded them that their value is not found in this world's opinion of them, but is found in almighty God. He shared scripture with them. He pointed people to Jesus. He told them, your worth is not in your likes on social media. It's not how much money you make one day. Your value comes from your creator. He loves you. I'm so proud of Walker. Congratulate him if you see him. He used that opportunity, that platform for Jesus. I'm so proud. God can never love you more than he loves you now. He will never love you less. You need to rest in that. Turn over to Titus chapter three, verses four through seven. If you struggle with worry and anxiety and you you question your worth, I want you to soak in this passage of scripture, Titus three, four through seven. It says, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Our worth is not found in who we are and what we've done or even in what we do for God. Our worth is found in whose we are, in who has us, and in what he's already done on our behalf. We belong to God through Jesus Christ. We are worth the shed blood of his son. If you're prideful, you need to remember that. And if you're insecure, you need to rest in that. You have a great worth. So we are to invest our wealth. We are to entrust our worth to him. And finally, I want to show you this morning, number three, why worry is worthless. Why worry is worthless. Jesus begins his admonition in verse 22 with the words, do not worry or do not be anxious. This is one of Jesus' favorite refrains along with its corollary. Do not fear. He says it all the time. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Do not fear. We might wonder why God cares whether we worry or not. It's because he's a good father. He wants us to know and understand that there's no circumstance you face that's outside of his sovereign control and his plan for your life. There's nothing that can ever happen to you that leaves God wringing his hands, wondering what to do next, wondering what's gonna happen next. No, he's always in control and he wants you to rest secure in that. Jesus says, worry is worthless. In verses 25 through 26, he says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Worry is worthless because it makes you think you are worth less than you really are. That your problems are bigger than your purpose. You begin to think that you're the sum total of your present circumstances. I want to give you three quick reasons why Worry is worthless. The first is, worriers are not happy people. They're just not. Have you been around worriers? They're not happy. They never rest in happiness, and they never appreciate the goodness of God. 
Their fears and pessimism keep them from enjoying and appreciating God's goodness. Secondly, worry is a negative reflection upon our Heavenly Father. It's a negative reflection on His goodness and grace in our life. Gloomy and nervous Christians are essentially declaring they do not trust in the goodness of God their Father. They think that He may very well let them down and allow them to fall into ruin and collapse. You know, it's, it's kind of insulting to a good parent when their kid thinks that they're not going to provide or come through for them. It's kind of insulting, isn't it? Don would always say to our kids when they were little, and they'd find out that they needed something for school, you know, over the weekend. I need this on Monday, and, and they'd panic and stuff, and, and we were like, we know, we got the email. And Don would famously say this. If you ask my kids, they could probably quote it. Have you ever not had what you needed? Have you ever not been prepared? Have I ever allowed you to not have everything you need? God is a good father. He knows what we need. The Bible says before we even ask, he'll give us what we need. Jesus commands us not to worry. By the way, church, I know you don't hear this a lot because we, we tend to, to grade sins, you know, on a, on, a, on a flexible chart. But Jesus commands us not to worry. Our Lord says, do not worry. Do not be anxious. So help me out, class. Anytime our Lord says we shouldn't do something and we do that thing, what is it called? It's sin, yeah. Worry, anxiety, it's sin. Why? Because Jesus told us not to do it. He didn't say don't worry unless, be anxious for some things. No, do not worry, be anxious for nothing. We seldom confess our worry, our anxiety as sin. And then we find ourselves out of fellowship with God. We're no longer hearing from him, from his word. We don't sense the presence of his Holy Spirit. Why? Because we are harboring worry and anxiety in our heart and our mind. And it keeps us from seeing spiritual things. That's the third thing. Being preoccupied with our physical needs through constant worry and fretting reduces our ability to focus upon spiritual things. We disconnect because we are preoccupied with worry and anxiety and we fail to confess it as sin and ask God to forgive us. We are to walk by faith, not by fright. Jesus says life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. And if you are continually preoccupied with everything might go wrong and are convinced that it probably will go wrong, how can you simultaneously be a person of faith? It's hard. You'll go through life with a divided mind. A mind that says God can, but he probably won't. God is able, but he's seldom willing. That's a life of a defeated believer. Filled with doubt, filled with worry, filled with anxiety. Oh, I believe God can, but he usually doesn't. I believe God will, but he probably won't. God is a good father. He knows what we need. This must be insulting to a God who gave you his best when you were at your worst. God gave you his best when you were undeserving, let alone when you're trying to please him with your life and serve him. Well, Jesus gives us two very very practical and constant reminders that we should not worry here in the text. One is ravens, one is lilies. He illustrates our worth by describing flyers and flowers. Ravens, God feeds them. And you are more valuable than they are. Pretty simple, isn't it? Every time you see a raven, you think, hey, they don't have storehouses or barns. They don't report to a nine to five. God takes care of them. I'm more valuable than a raven. Pretty simple. But if you're plagued with worry and anxiety all the time, just look to the sky. See the birds. God takes care of them. Early in this passage, he says, you're more valuable than a sparrow. Can't you buy two for a copper penny? You're more valuable than they are. God knows when every sparrow falls. He's counted the numbers of hair on your head. You are valuable. Rest in that. 
Look at the lilies. God clothes them gloriously. You are more valuable than flowers and grass, which is here today, gone tomorrow. You guys, next time you're out on your mower cutting your grass, I'm more valuable than this grass. More valuable. It grows up, I cut it down. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. God takes care of the grass. It keeps on growing. Beautiful green grass here in Georgia, thank God. Back in Texas, we were there a couple weeks ago. Everything's brown, yellow, dried up. Come back to Georgia, it's like the Garden of Eden, northeast Georgia. Flowers are blooming. Trees, we have trees that grow here that don't even, they've never seen Texas. They couldn't survive the heat. It's so arid and parched out there. But this beautiful grass that God just freely provides, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. You are so much more valuable than the grass. Every time you walk through your lawn, you need to remind yourself of that. More valuable than flowers, more valuable than flyers. God is our loving father. He knows exactly what we need. So like a raven, fly free from worry. Like a lily, bloom where you're planted. And if you find yourself beginning to worry this week, remember that your worth is not tied up in your wealth. God paid for you with the prince of heaven. In fact, instead of worrying, start praying. Turn with me to Philippians 4. This is a passage that we will visit again before the series is over. And I encourage those of you that worry is your particular sin. Worry is your particular downfall. Anxiety is what gets you down. You need to memorize this passage of Scripture. If Dallas can memorize 830 of them, you can memorize two verses, okay? Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for what, church? Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want you to consider the peace of God as this giant armed guard. And when you pray instead of worry, these armed guards take up position around your heart and your mind. And when worry tries to come in and anxiety comes your way, they escort them out. They guard your heart. They guard your mind. Let's stand together this morning as we begin a time of invitation. Listen, in summary, you need to be reminded today that your wealth is temporary. We need to invest it in heaven. The best thing that you can do with your money is give it away for the glory of God. I'm not just saying that because I'm a preacher. Jesus said that. Seek first his kingdom. Send it on. Send it on. Secondly, our worth is eternal because we entrust it to God. He's the one who created us. He paid the ultimate price for us. He promises us eternal life. Don't let the vapor of this life stress you out. A life that's here today, gone tomorrow. Trust in the eternal one who holds you in his mighty hand. Your worry is an infernal enemy. You need to expel it from your life. Confess it as sin. Say, God, I'm sorry I doubt you. Forgive me. Fill my heart with faith, not with fear. And if God cares for the flowers and the flowers, how much more will he care for you? Listen, some of you need to stop dragging the gray clouds of tomorrow over today. And thank God for right now, right now. Ask God to set you free. He will, he will. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to worry about. Now, if you're not this morning, if you don't know Jesus, you should be worried. You should be worried because you're banking everything on this world that's passing away. And there's coming a day where you'll stand before God and give an account of your life, and unless you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will only faith God's wrath against sin and His judgment. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I challenge you to turn from your sin and trust in Him. Salvation is a free gift that must be received. When we sing in a moment, there's going to be pastors across the front. We'd love to show you from God's Word how you can be saved, and know without a doubt, you have an eternal inheritance that will not fade away, that's reserved in heaven for you. Maybe you're here this morning, though, you've been battling with worry. You just need to come and pray. You need to confess it as sin and say, God, forgive me. Fill my heart with peace. Guard my mind and my heart with the peace of your Holy Spirit. But let's do business with God today.
Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Jesus, we are frail. Lord, we, we often get concerned by the things of this world, by what we see, by our circumstances. We think we're not going to have enough. We think we're not going to be enough. And Satan just heaps guilt and concern on our shoulders. I pray today that instead of listening to those voices, we listen to your word and we recognize that our life is in your hands, that we can invest in eternity, Lord, and you will protect our possessions. Lord, help us to do the right thing and be obedient to your commands. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.